Let's bow our heads, shall we? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you and we are grateful for a good night's rest. We are thankful that you have protected us from the storms and we know that you will continue to protect us through the storms that will be coming also. And Lord, we ask and pray this morning that your Holy Spirit will continue to abide with us and that you will, will touch my lips that they may speak your words. That the things that I have ready to present may be pushed aside so that your message, Lord, may be heard. May it fall upon a heart that is receptive to know, to grow, and to follow your will. For we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On March 11, 2011, in the northern part of Japan, there was an earthquake that rocked the country. If you look at your screen, I am going to be sharing a little bit from this. There was an earthquake that hit the country that devastated it at 9.0. What are the facts about this earthquake? Well, the facts are pretty simple. It was the largest ever recorded earthquake to hit Japan. It was actually the sixth largest to occur on the earth. It was the largest earthquake to hit since the year 1960. And just before this particular earthquake that hit the northern part of Japan, 200 miles off the coast of Sendai, there was another earthquake that hit in the country called New Zealand. Do you remember that? A little place called Christchurch. Well, just to give you some idea, you saw the news, you saw the, the images of what happened in Christchurch with the devastation that happened there. This particular earthquake was actually 8,000 times, 8, times stronger than the one that happened in Christ Church, 8,000 times. And we find that what the earthquake didn't kill, the tsunami did. Right after the earthquake happened, the earthquake happened on, a, on a Friday, I noticed on my friend's Facebook wall, Dr. Tim Riesenberger on Monday, he posted that he was cleared from his foundation to go to Japan. Now, I had worked with Dr. Tim Ritzenberger uh, several times. We were on a mission trip together in Cambodia. Then we were in an evangelistic series together to the Hmong people in Sacramento area. And then we went to Haiti together to help out with the earthquake out there. So when I saw, when he posted on Facebook that he was cleared, I called him within five minutes of that posting, and I said, are you going for sure, Tim? He says, well, I'm just waiting for final clearance right now, but it should be going soon. He said, are you going to come? I said, call me. Let me know when you're approved. Well, in between that time period, I thought, okay, I'm really excited to go. But then I started reading a little bit about uh, Fukushima, the little uh, nuclear power plant and the radioactiveness that was happening there. And all of a sudden, my excitement was not so hot to be able to get out there. I mean, I want to be glowing for Christ, but not glowing in other ways. <laughs> Tim called me Tuesday night, uh, Wednesday night at 10 p.m., received a late phone call from him, and the words were, I'm cleared. I'm leaving tomorrow. Are you coming? Of a... Of a uh, um, I, yeah, well, I need to talk to my wife. And I know what my wife would, would have said. In my thinking, she would have said, you want to go where? Are you crazy? So I called her in my office, and I turned around my chair, and I said to her, Tim's cleared for going to Japan. Fully expecting the words to say, you're not going. But, you know, I am very thankful to be married to a very godly wife who understands the call. And her words were, what she looked at me, she said, so what are you waiting for? I said, nothing. I went back to the computer, and I started booking my flight. Well, it was $1,700 to fly over there. Hmm, that's a lot of money. Being in self-supporting ministry, I, I don't have that type of funds just to throw out there. But what I do have because of self-supporting ministry is I have miles. So I cranked out 70,000 delta points to be able to go over there. 
Come to find out I didn't, I, I'm usually very meticulous in my planning, but I had not planned out carefully my return flight because I was just somewhere excited about getting there and making sure that my arrival time was on time because I had to be back home by Wednesday or by Tuesday the next week. I had to be home by Tuesday evening because I had a flight Wednesday morning to Southern Adventist University because I was going to preach at Southern on Thursday morning, of all things, for their Asian Emphasis Week. And so I booked the flight, but I had to change my flight when I was actually in Japan because I forgot that in not looking carefully, I had a seven and a half hour layover in Minneapolis. I didn't want to do that. So it costed me another 25,000 points to switch that flight around. So it ended up being a 95,000 point flight, which was fine. It's just points. And um, we arrived there. I booked the same time period. Tim was leaving from the Seattle area. I was leaving from South Bend, Indiana. And we booked the same type of flight. And so I made it very clear to him. I said, okay, when we get there, because our cell phones aren't going to work, I will meet you on the opposite side of customs. So as soon as you get out of customs, wait there, and we'll, we'll meet. Because we were both coming in at 4.15 p.m. in the afternoon. So I arrived, and I noticed his flight had arrived just a few minutes earlier than mine. And so I looked for him in customs, didn't see him. So I thought, okay, as soon as I get out of customs, I'll find Tim. Well, I walked out of customs and I looked around. Now, because if you've noticed, I, I'm a little tall. Um, the, some of the Japanese people, most of them are much shorter, especially when you go to the Philippines, they're even shorter than that. So I stick out like a sore thumb. And, um, and you might wonder too, by the way, why am I abnormally tall for being Asian? and most of them are shorter. It's because of what you eat, right? Uh, they eat short grain rice. I eat extra long grain rice. So that makes the big difference there. That says it all. Americans eat pizza. And so I arrived there fully expecting to see Tim. Walked out of customs and no Tim. And I thought, uh-oh. This is in a foreign land now. How am I going to find Tim? So I asked the security people. I said, look, I have a friend coming in, and he's coming in on American Airlines. He didn't understand anything I said until I said American Airlines. And he said, oh, Terminal 2. Well, where are we at? He said, Terminal 1. It's like, oh, no. So I had to run around finding. Luckily, Terminal 2 was just down the road. I found Tim there, and then he had the the bad news for us. We were fully expecting we would hop on a train and head up to Sendai right away while well, the trains weren't running. So now we have to stay the night in Tokyo. Well, where are we going to stay? He says, well, I've got some people that I could call and at the English Language Institute. And so we ended up staying in Tokyo that night, and we had to take a train, on a bus on Sabbath morning that would take seven hours now by bus to be able to get up to Sendai. Time is crunching down. So here we are, we're lining up for the bus, and all these people are lined up to go on the bus as well. And I couldn't figure out, why are all these people lined up on the bus, and why are they going to Sendai? Because everybody's wanting to leave Sendai, why are they going up there? So I asked a few people, do you speak English? Another one, do you speak English? No. Finally I asked another lady, do you speak English? Yes. I said, why are you going up to Sendai? Why are all these people going up to Sendai? She says, we're bringing food to our loved ones up there. I thought, wow, OK. So that makes sense. So here we are in the picture. You can see we're lined up. That man is holding a yellow sign that says Sendai on it. And everybody's lined up to go to Sendai. Six hour bus ride. We get there. We stay at someone's place that allowed us. We had made arrangements. They allowed us to stay there. You know, we see in the news the information about Sendai. And I thought, OK, we're going to be coming into a city that is totally devastated, population of a million people, and there's not going to be anything there. Well, when we got there, believe it or not, we didn't see anything of devastation from the earthquake nor the tsunami. I was a little taken back by that. The walls, their, their construction is very, very solid. In fact, in the residential homes, their doors are not just made of aluminum, like our front doors, front, you know, just aluminum core. This was a solid steel door that they have. The walls are all solid concrete. We got there, and sure enough, everything was fortified, and there was no issue. Now we found out 
Sunday morning, we had to go through the prefecture, which is the state, and we had to get clearance. Well, we went to get clearance, and the problem was they don't want help. Now, when we went to Haiti, it was amazing because you had charter flights of people coming over in throngs to Port-au-Prince Airport ready to help out, and we took a charter flight down there. But this was a different situation. They don't want help. They're a first world country. They have their own help, so they didn't want any help. So we got a little discouraged. We said, Lord, we know that you didn't bring us here for nothing, so we need you to open the doors for us. We went back to the room. We were just so distraught, and at 1 o'clock, we knelt down together, and that's what we prayed. Five minutes later, we get a phone call. Just five minutes later, from one of the guys that happened to have stayed, who runs an NGO, a non-government organization, and he called us and he said, hey, did you guys get anywhere with the prefecture? I said, no, we, we really didn't. He says, well, I did. He said, I, we've got a, a bus heading up to Ishinomaki. Do you want to come? I said, absolutely. Where are we going to stay? Don't know. Probably the city hall area. That's fine. So we lined up, we got to Ishinomaki by late Sunday night. About 10 o'clock, we got to Ishinomaki. It was dark. There was no power, couldn't see anything, couldn't see any of the devastation at all. When we arrived, I walked inside the city hall building, and there it was partially lit up because the Japanese military brought in a Hummer that had this huge generator on the back, and it powered the entire five, six-story building. What we noticed right away was there was this uh, missing persons board. We stayed right across the hall from what they referred to as the, the places that is taking the census. And so it was very humble and very quiet there because many people were reporting their lost loved ones there. Well, at that point, I had one day left. It was Sunday night. I had just Monday. I couldn't, I couldn't help at all. There wasn't enough time to help. At this point, I needed to just document. So at the appropriate time, at 4.30 in the morning, I said, Lord, I got to get up. And so the Lord woke me up at 4.30. By 5 o'clock, we were out on the streets taking a look and seeing what was out there. When we first walked out there, we saw a little bit of devastation. You can see where the debris from the sea that came in was probably at around 30 inches high. That didn't seem like very much. But we were inland in a little ways. And as we walked around some more, we see this lady here cleaning out all the garbage out of her store. Here, this is a bookstore that obviously was not really very valid anymore as a bookstore because all of it was soggy pages. And I walked around with a gentleman who runs a non-profit group, and he actually owns a distribution fuel company in California, in Southern California, in Riverside. And what he does is he comes in and he accommodates a fuel truck, and he basically gives fuel away to people free. Can you imagine that? helping them fill up their, the military, the police, with gas so they can find the gas, or people who have generators to fill up their generators so they can keep going. So Ted and I walked down the streets, and these are the, the images that we saw. Here's a house, but there's no house anymore. The stairs go up, but everything's gone. The alleyways were clogged with vehicles and debris, as things floated through and couldn't stop anymore. Vehicles were very easily turned over like they were little Legos. In the middle of the streets of downtown, they were laden with debris from the sea. Big ships came in. They cornered vehicles. They impaled buildings. Now, I know that the owner of this little quiet car did not intend to park his car inside a ship. This was the biggest ship we saw in Ishinomaki, dry docked. All the way along that little river that came in, we saw different types of debris as the, as the water came in with such powerful force. It pushed the cars and everything around. But there were people out there earnestly trying to clean away to get their life back in order. Through the streets of downtown Ishinomaki, we saw the the streets were mainly cleaned up, but what wasn't cleaned up, when you look closer, you would see all the debris. That, right in the center of that picture are shoes piled up there. 
another alleyway <clears throat> filled with vehicles. Looking down the streets, they had cleared a little corridor way so emergency vehicles can get through. It broke my heart to be able to see a Yamaha piano store with the pianos just pushed around like they were little pieces of toothpicks. And then right around the corner, one of the pianos had floated out somehow, out of the window area, and it got lodged underneath the vehicle. By the elementary school, the elementary school was turned into an evacuation center. Some of the vehicles were pushed into the swimming pool area. It lodged about 800 uh, refugees there. Going across the walkway, we saw an, um, a fire engine. We found out that the fire engine came through with the initial earthquake that hit at 9.0. And it came to help out because there must have been broken gas lines. But you see, when the earthquake happened, the tsunami warning was sent out. And the people of this particular town, Ishinomaki, had 15 minutes. That's all they had. Just a 15 minute warning to get to high ground. Well, when that fire engine came in, it came in to help, but it didn't take the 15 minutes and pay attention to that to try and get out. You see, it was very different there. They're on an honor system. They didn't go out raiding homes like we see at Hurricane Katrina. You don't see people going through Walmart and start stealing things. No, they, it was very comfortable. People were standing in line. They were waiting for their food. And what food they had, what little food they had, they shared with other people. If they had a few spoonfuls themselves, that was plenty for them. They gave away what they had. We went further up in the afternoon, the early afternoon part. We walked up to this one area because we noticed that there was a, a very high plateau going up a hill. So we thought we would go up there to take a look and see what we could find on the other side because it was blocking the way so we couldn't get around to see what was closer to the shoreline. And when we made our way up there, <clears throat> I was walking up, and there was a very old lady that was walking up this hill. And I'll tell you, it was a good-sized hill to walk up. She was carrying a five-gallon bucket of water, a container of water, but it was only half full. And I wasn't sure why it was only half full until I, I looked at the lady, and she was a very frail old lady. She must have been at least 65, 70, but very small lady. And she was carrying this. I mean, you could tell she was just leaning, trying to hold this thing, and probably couldn't take any more because she couldn't handle the weight. So I offered to carry that for her, and I carried it up the hill along with my 25 pounds where the camera gear I was carrying along, and brought it up there. And we asked her, because I had a translator with me, where would be the best spot to be able to see what's over there? So she showed us where that place would be. But we passed a high school. And when we passed this high school, there were two sets of double doors. You're looking at one set of double doors. Those are the missing persons pictures on there. Some of them, if you notice, there weren't many pictures on there. But on the next set of doors, there were a few pictures that caught my attention. A mom and dad stuck this picture up of their little children. One's three years old and one's six years old. And they were missing. Another mom and dad stuck up the picture of their little two-year-old girl missing. When we made it to the top, we found that the cherry blossoms had not quite broke out yet. But this country is pretty much Buddhist. And you find that their prayers are tied in a knot to the trees. And as we came to this particular vantage point, we looked out, and what we saw was amazing. You looked across the river, and you saw the devastation. People came up to take a look themselves to see what this was all about. Big boats pushed along. This is that elementary school that was turned into a refugee center. You can see the buildings in the bottom right corner are just totally annihilated. Going up the street from there, more buildings pushed out. There was a little island in the middle, and this was annihilated as well. If it wasn't made out of concrete, it wasn't standing. When you looked at the main part, it was totally wiped out. And you wonder, but the wave we saw back at City Hall was only 30 inches high. Yes, but the wave that came through along the shoreline was 30 feet high. And it annihilated everything in its path. 
If you look very carefully in the center of this image, you'll see that there's a lady with her back turned towards you, and she's trying to get things that her husband is passing to her coming out of that house. More devastation. In the middle part of the picture, there are three vehicles turned upside down there. And all the way through. And I happened to look down from the place I was standing, and I saw four men in jumpsuits. On the back of their jumpsuits, it said Ishinomaki. And these were the firemen. Some of them looking at the survey, surveying the damage for the very first time, seeing that they probably had lost their own homes, they may have lost family members. They may have lost their fire station or their fire truck. And then out of all the, the stuff that I saw there, one thing caught my attention. It was this little post. And it said right there in English, may peace prevail on earth. You know, as that came across, I started thinking about those words, may peace prevail on earth. Here I am standing and I'm looking at the devastation of what is going on. Is it possible that peace could prevail on earth? You see, according to Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, the Bible tells us, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things shall happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of the birth pains. It's just the beginning. So you see, from what I understand, this earthquake that hit Japan at a 9.0, that's a huge earthquake. But I will tell you something. There is another earthquake, my friends, that is coming upon this earth, one that this earth has never seen. And this earthquake is going to so rock this earth that as a result of this earthquake, people will come alive out of these graves. From Selected Gifts, Volume 2, page 34. Then there was a mighty earthquake, and the graves opened. And the dead came up clothed with immortality. The 144,000 shouted hallelujah as they recognized their friends who had been torn from them by death. And in the same moment, we were changed and caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And all entered the cloud together, and there were seven days ascending to the sea of glass when Jesus brought along the crowns and with his own right hand placed them on our heads he gave us harps of gold and palms of victory. I have good news and I have bad news. This, on the good news side, is coming very quickly. The bad news side of it, though, well, let me just read to you from Matthew 24, verse 9. It says this, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Will be saved. I want to ask you a question. Do you trust God? Do you trust him? Because I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, if you don't trust God now, you're not going to be able to stand in the end. And I say that without reservation at all. You will not be able to stand at the end because if you don't know your Heavenly Father now, if you do not have a saving, sanctifying relationship with him now, and building upon that, you will not be able to stand in the last days because you won't even be able to detect the apostasy that's coming. It will be universal. Ellen White writes in Great Controversy, she said, so closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except through Holy Scriptures. You won't know unless you have that word hidden in your heart. 
Isn't that what David wrote? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We find here in Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 2, Moses, I think about Moses' story. You know, and I, I, I am in awe when you think about Moses and the story of what he did with the children of Israel. I want you to think about this for a moment. Moses is out there. God calls to him to go and take these people and take them out of Egypt. We talked about this last night. How many children of Israel were there? About three million. When Moses went out there, do you think that he had all these things already calculated of like where they're going to camp, what they're going to do? Do you think he had all that figured out? I don't think he did at all. Not, Not by the slightest means. I believe that he trusted fully in God. Let me give you some information of what you might want to look at it or think about here as far as Moses. You see, according to the quartermaster general of the army, Moses, if he had three million people, that required a lot of food. You know, the manna rained down. It came down in the morning for them. Do you know how much food it takes to feed three million people? 1,500 tons of food a day. Now, let's say that we had to encapsulate that into a, uh, a train to be able to bring this, just to give us size. That would be two freight trains a mile long. That would just be the food for one day. But, but wait a second. Remember, they had to cook some of this food, too. Now, three million people had to cook some firewood, and uh, that would take 4,000 4, tons of wood. That would be a few freight trains a few miles long, just for one day. But you know, the desert, the wilderness is very hot. And that would require a lot of water, wouldn't it? Three million people require a lot of water. Let's say that they just, you know, there was enough food for them. They had to wash a few dishes. And not only that, but let's say they have their livestock too. That would require 11 million gallons of water a day. You know how much that would take? That would be, let's put it into a freight car. And the tankers would be approximately 1,800 miles long just for one day. But remember, they also crossed the Red Sea. According to the biblical account, they crossed the Red Sea at nighttime. The sea parted, and Moses and the children of Israel walked through. Three million people to walk through a little line. That would take a little while. When you think about it, if they actually lined up in a narrow path and they went double file through that line, do you know how long that line of three million people would be? It would extend 800 miles long. It would take them 35 days and nights, but they did it in one night. So there had to have been enough space in the Red Sea, so much space that it had to have been at least three miles wide so they could walk at least 5,000 abreast to get across. That's a lot, isn't it? You know, every time Moses stopped, he says, okay, whoa, we're going to camp here tonight. Do you know how big that little campground would take? It would take about two-thirds the size of the state of Rhode Island when they stopped. Can you imagine that? Because everybody's got, you know, they've got their own, uh, their livestock and all that stuff that they're pulling through. That takes a lot of time and a lot of place. Do you think Moses figured all this out ahead of time? Do you think he had it calculated down to the math and the science of all the things? I don't think so. Going back to patriarchs and prophets, Moses saw before him difficulties that seem insurmountable. What proof could he give his people that God had indeed sent him? Behold, he said, They will not believe me, Lord, nor will they hearken to my voice. For they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Evidence that appealed to his own senses was now given. He was told to cast his rod before the ground. And he did so, and it became a serpent. And he was told, take your hand and put it inside your coat. And it became leprous. But you see, the servant of God was overwhelmed by the thought of the strange and wonderful work before him. In his distress... 
he feared. He feared that he lacked this eloquence. So he came up with his excuse. But, 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 but Lord, you see, I, I can't. I... Oh, Lord, I'm not eloquent, he says. Neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and a slow tongue. The Lord says, Moses, who made man's mouth? Who makes the person deaf, dumb, or the blind to see? Is it not I, the Lord? These excuses at first proceeded from humility and indifference, but after the Lord had promised to remove all difficulties and give him final success, then any further shrinking back and complaining of his unfitness showed his distrust for God. It implied a fear that God was unable to qualify him for the great work which he had called him to do, or that he had made a mistake in the selection of a man. Does God make mistakes? Does he? You see, the divine command was given to Moses, and Moses found himself self-distrustful, slow of speech, very timid. He was overwhelmed with a sense of his incapacity to be a mouthpiece for God, the God of Israel. But, but once he accepted the work, he entered upon it with the whole heart, and he put all his trust in the Lord. Patriarchs and Prophets tells us the greatness of his mission called for the greatest... Let me rephrase that again. <clears throat> the greatness of his mission called into exercise the best powers of his mind. God blessed his ready obedience, and he became eloquent, hopeful, self-possessed, and well-fitted for the greatest work ever given to man. The greatest... This is an example of what God does to strengthen the character of those who trust him fully and give themselves unreservedly to his command. You see, Moses was so full of excuses. He initially lacked faith. He lacked a trust in God. And it was because of this lack of faith that he came up with all these excuses. Lord, Lord, you know, what if I said, Lord, I, I, I can't go to Japan. Did you see the amount of radiation that's leaking out, Lord? Hello? You know what our problem is? <clears throat> our problem is our lack of faith. That's our problem. When you look at it, it comes down to two words. What and how. Think about that for a moment. Two simple words, what and how. <clears throat> Let me break those down for you because imagine Moses standing at the Red Sea. The Israelites are, are complaining to him, Moses, Moses, you see the Pharaoh's army is coming. We're fortified on, on all sides by these walls. We cannot climb up the walls. We can't go forward because we've got the Red Sea there. What are we going to do? We've got to have faith. We have to have trust in the Lord. You see, our issue is this. Our issue is the what. Did you catch that? Our issue is the what. Whatever obstacles you face in your life, our issue is the what. What, I what is our issue? We must be faithful to God. But, but how are we going to cross the Red Sea? Ah, not my problem. Did you catch that? Not my problem. My problem is the what. God's problem is the how. Moses, just stand still. Watch. There it goes. That's it. Take you to the feeding of the multitude. Do you know Jesus fed the multitudes, right? How many people did he feed? 5,000. We all quote 5,000. But he also fed, fed 4,000 people. According to the account, there was 5,000 men and 4,000. Do you know why both? Why, why did he do both? It wasn't just happenstance that, oh, what, 5,000 one day, and next week it was 4,000. No, it was very specific. The 5,000 were the Jews. 
But you see, whatever Jesus did for the Jews, he wanted to show that he didn't come just to save the Jews. He came to save everyone. So he did it to the 4,000, which were the Gentiles as well. But you notice once again, the disciples came up to him, okay, okay Jesus, uh, you see the people are hungry. What are we going to do now? They, they want food. Jesus didn't say, send them to McDonald's. He said, go find some food. Where's, where's your, uh, we don't have anything. Well, go find something. They came back and they said, um, all, all we found is just these five little loaves. When we think loaves, we're not thinking our loaves of bread, okay? We're talking, this is a, a little boy's lunch. I don't see a little boy eating five loaves of bread like this. We're talking like, it would be kind of like what we would consider rolls. <laughs> five little rolls of bread. And two little fish. We're not talking fish. We're talking little fish for a little boy's lunch. Because I don't see the little, you know, he was carrying around his lunch in his little lunch box, not like a lunch sack. And the disciples were like, um, this is all we found. But Jesus, see, Jesus didn't ask him to break that out to everybody. He said, just go find it. They had to do the what? what that, that, there's the what. What was it? Well, you wanted us to find the food. Here's the food. How, how are you going to feed the 5,000 now? Not, not their problem. It wasn't the disciples' problem. That was up to Jesus. And he started breaking the bread. Breaking it, breaking, breaking, breaking. And they all ate. Was it 5,000? No. How many more? Add in the women. Add in the children. And there was still food left over. Our problem is the what? God's problem is the how. Look at Daniel in the lion's den. When you get this whole story, these guys cornered Daniel in such a way because they knew Daniel was faithful to God. Every day at noontime, he knelt down there in the open window. Do you think when the decree came out to, to serve the king, did Daniel cower behind like some furniture and pray? No, he stood. It was like clockwork. They could adjust their clock to it. They knew at that given time, Daniel's going to be in the window. But Daniel knew about the decree. Did he care? No. Why didn't he care? Because of the what. The what says, I will be faithful to God no matter what. But you see, Daniel, you don't, don't you understand? You could, be, you could be thrown into the lion's den. Not my problem. <laughs> Not my problem. My problem is the what? The how? God's problem. Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. What's he going to do? You know, I remember these, the kids, they watch Veggie Tales. And I, I was appalled with this particular part of Veggie Tales because it shows Daniel getting thrown into the lion's den. And do you know what they were doing according to the Veggie Tales aspect? What was Daniel doing inside with the, the lions? They were having a pizza party. I dare say, Daniel was on his knees and he was praying. You're in with a bunch of lions. The what? You pray. The how? How is God going to protect you? Not Daniel's problem. He was to pray. And he prayed. And did God protect him? Absolutely. Let's go back a few verses in the book of Daniel, and we come to his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're standing here on the plain of Dura, and they were all told, when you hear the sound of all these different types of instruments, with all kinds of music, in symphony with one another, everybody is to bow down to worship the image. By the way, that image, that image is the image, what's it called? What's that image called? The image of what? Nebuchadnezzar, right? That's the image, isn't it? Have you ever noticed, what is that image supposed to be of symbolically now? It's the image of Babylon, isn't it? 
Have you ever noticed there's a resemblance between this image and this image? You ever noticed that? The Oscar Awards? It's pretty much the same image. You notice it's gold, too. It's a singular man standing there. Hmm. So Hollywood's highest honor is the image of Babylon. Funny how that would be, isn't it? I don't think it's happenstance. But we find here Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, are, they find themselves standing in front of this image. And notice that image, too, is 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. It is the image. Everybody around them bows down. And they prostrate them, themselves before that image. But you know what? Have you ever been to Nebraska? I mean, nothing, I mean, a stop sign sticks out like a sore thumb for miles around. I went to Union College, and I'll tell you, there's nothing there. If, if you're cycling and you want to practice hill training, you've got to go into the ditch and come back out of the ditch. There's nothing there. Daniel, Daniel's friends, stuck out like a sore thumb. They would not bow the knee. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there. What was their issue? To be faithful to God. You shall not bow down to any God. You will not serve any God. I am the Lord your God. And they were not to bow down. But all these things were going to happen to them. I mean, if they get tossed into the fiery furnace, how are they? Not their problem. That's God's problem. And did God take care of that? Absolutely. In Judges chapter 7, we find Gideon, Gideon's little band, 32,000 men. That's how Gideon was going to do it. The Lord says to Gideon, too many. What, what, what God? Uh, too many. We've got to shrink it down. But you see, I, I've calculated, I need the 32,000 men. Well, that's what you need, but that's not what I need. Okay, Lord, well, how do I know? Well, just tell them. <clears throat> if you're scared, go home. Okay, 10,000, gone. Now you're down 22,000. Still too many. Ooh. It gets down to 300 men. 300! I mean, that, that's... That's 1% of what Gideon started with, less than 1%. How? How is Gideon going to conquer? It's not his problem. Not his problem. It's God's problem. When we take ourselves and we throw ourselves at the foot of Jesus, it's not our problem. We throw it down to him and we say, Lord, it's your problem. I'm being faithful to you. Be faithful to me. Is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything too hard for God? You see, the saying always says, and I remember my dear friend Samuel Pippen would always say this, God has a thousand ways of which we know none. And if he was here today, he would say the same thing. He has a thousand ways of which we cannot even fathom nor calculate how. He's God. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, Isaiah writes these words. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. No matter what we think, it is not what God thinks. So our ability to think is different than God's ability to know how. I started with these images of Japan because I wanted to be able to explain to you there's a need out there. What's the need? There are 125 million people in the country of Japan, just slightly more than a third of what's in the US. 125 million people. 
Now, if you came to, if you asked in the United States, what percentage of this country is considered Christian? What would your answer be? More than 50%? Oh, yeah, for sure, more than 50%. Did you know that in the country of Japan, there are less than 1.2 million professed Christians? You know what that is? That's less than 1%. Less than 1%. 1.25 million Christians. Now let me lay something else on you. There are only 16,000 Seventh-day Adventists. 16,000 Seventh-day Adventists of a country that has 1.25 million Christians. Is there work to be done? Absolutely. Is there work to be done here in Thornville? Ohio, in your own hometown, in the conference of Ohio, yes. So, what is our problem? What is our problem? You see, this is our problem. We have this head knowledge, but we have not put it into a practical knowledge of Jesus Christ. We don't know how to go out there, and we don't know how to say anything because we lack the how. No, we lack the what. Because if we knew the what, we wouldn't have any problem with the how. We keep saying in our head, how are we going to do this? How we... No, 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 no. All God wants is the what? Be faithful to him. Be faithful to him. So when he says to you, look, I will be with you always. Always. I will be with you always. I've given you the boundaries. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Does that cover it? Does that give you the jurisdiction? Yes, heaven and on earth. Are you on earth? All power, all authority. So if God gave us all that authority in all that area, then what does he want us to do with it? Well, we find that he says to us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you Monday through Friday during the hours of 9 through 5. Is that what he says? I am with you always. But see, the problem is we don't trust him. And just like Moses, when we don't believe it and we don't put it into practical sense, we call God a liar. You know why our churches are dying? Because our people don't know how to go out there and explain what they believe because they don't have any practical knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm going to lay a heavy one on you because you're the ones who are supposed to be serious about the gospel. But you can't sit there in your pew Sabbath after Sabbath and think church people or people from the outside will come into the church by osmosis. It doesn't happen that way. You've got to go out there and you've got to do the work. But who? Who am I supposed to talk with? You know what? That's not, that's not your problem. You just go out there in the morning and you say, Lord, bring someone to me today that I can lead to the foot of the cross. And you know what? All you have to do is pray that prayer and here's what you do next. You reach across and you grab the seatbelt and you click because you're going to go for a ride today. It happens every time I pray that prayer. It happens. I love flying. Especially the long international flights. You know why? Because I always take the aisle seat and I always have a captive audience next to me. The Lord always puts someone next to me. And I, I, I don't ask them. I don't push anything. I just kind of feel around and I'll say, okay, Lord, you lead the conversation. So I'll ask them, so what do you do? Da, da, da. They start talking. And then it always comes back. Uh, so what do you do? I'm, a, I'm an evangelist. I travel around the world. Oh, really? 
And I tried to avoid this once. And I, the guy says, so uh, um, he, was, he was a big time preacher too, traveling around. And he was trying to corner me. And he says, so um, who do you preach for? Uh, for the Lord. He says, so okay, so but when a church invites you, uh, what type of church invites you to come? I said, well, the church that wants me to preach. <laughs> and he says, okay, so um, then he finally just came down to it and he says, are you part of a denomination? I said, yeah. Which one? Seventh-day Adventist. Oh. <laughs> You're one of those. Uh-huh. What do you know about him? Well, n not that much. I said, really? I pull open my iPad. I said, so really, you don't know much about Adventists? <laughs> so I'm just, I've got it sitting there, and I'm ready to go with it. So I said, okay, silently in my head, I'm praying, Lord, lead the conversation. Show me what I'm supposed to show him. So I wait in the conversation, and I'm pushing as much as I can away. I, I've never tried to push away, but this guy, I've tried to push away on the conversation as much as possible. And we start talking about all the different light things. Come to find out, we pretty much stayed in the same town during the same time period, and we knew a lot of the same people. So I'm still waiting. Because I, I don't want to take one step unless I know the Lord is there. So finally he says to me, <clears throat> so what's the difference between what I believe and what you believe as a Seventh-day Adventist? I pulled open my iPad and I thought, you know, I thought you'd never ask. Let me share with you some of these things. And I pulled open my evangelistic series to the Sabbath. Started with the Sabbath. I said, here, go through this. So he sat there and he was going through that. His wife sat there looking at it too. And you could see him leafing through the, the whole program. And you could see the pauses, you know, because they're, they're reading the text, they're reading the text, and then sometimes they would pause to reflect on that text for a moment. He went through the whole thing, the change of the Sabbath. His wife leans over and looks at me. She says, I believe Saturday is the Sabbath. I said, Praise the Lord. He says, well, I'm not sure, you know. I said, well, all these were not my words. This is the Bible. Yeah, but you know, everybody's been going to church on Sunday for, for so... I said, did you see that one verse, Could the one you stopped at, that says, should we obey men, the, the traditions of man, or, or God? Well, yeah, but you know, it's hard to believe that there would be so many millions of people. I said, tradition or God? I sat on another flight, and uh, the lady asked me the same question. So what do you do? I said, I'm actually going to Ireland to preach an evangelistic series. Oh, really? Well, I go to church on Sunday, so what's different from what I believe to what you believe? That was a four-and-a-half-hour Bible study on the Sabbath. You may fear, I don't know what to say. That's great. Because if you have all the confidence in the world, God can't use you. It's better that you don't know anything and you just have the ability to be used by God. Because what he does is he will give you the words to say and you will find yourselves speaking words that you had never planned to say because God gives you those words. But you see, in order for God to give you those words, first of all, you have had to have some knowledge of this. That's why it says, thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, you may read these things, but you may think, I, I don't remember all these things, but you know what? They're there. The capacity of the brain. Have you ever heard of these people called idiot savants? They're, they're, in one aspect, they are just extremely intelligent in one area. They could memorize vast numbers. They can, they can play the piano or they can um, draw things. Or they can do mathematical calculations. But imagine if all of these different aspects were put into one person. This is how it was before the flood, I believe, with all my heart. I believe they had all the intellect. I remember when I graduated from Andrews University uh, with my master's in youth ministry, the speaker that we had for graduation was somebody you all know, Dr. Ben Carson. 
Now, at Pioneer Memorial Church, you have 2,500 people that sit there. And it's, it's a massive graduation service program. And he came up there, and he's talking about the capacity of the brain. And he says, let me tell you what the capacity of the brain is. He said, if I brought a five-year-old little child up here and had her blindfolded and just unblinded full, uh, took off the blindfold just for a few seconds, and she could peer out and look at all of you, I put the blindfold back on, and I would send her away. 50 years later, if I could tap into the, her brain and stimulate some of the synapses of her brain, he said, she could tell me where each one of you were sitting that day at Pioneer Memorial Church. You think that's wow? The next statement was even more of a wow. He said, and she could tell me what you were wearing. That's the power of the brain. But you see, if you don't fill your brain with this, you've got nothing in there to regurgitate back out. Because what's in there, God can use to bring out. But if you garbage in, guess what? Garbage comes out. If you want to be used by the Lord, brothers and sisters, you have to have stuff to sow. You told me you're a literature evangelist. You got books in your car right now? Of course. Any literature evangelist is going to have books in his car. I travel with my bookcase all the time, my bag or whatever, my camera bag. I have stuff with me, especially when I'm air traveling, because I have signs of the times they call the glow cards now. The new generation calls them glow. We call them the little sign cards, you know, the little tracks. I carry little great controversies with me, and I pass those out. Who do I pass them out to? I listen for the Holy Spirit prompting me. Sometimes in the plane at 40,000 feet, I put them in the bathrooms. You might think, well, that seems to be a crazy place to put it. Well, you know what? There's no other reading material in there for them, so I put it inside there. And you know what? I'll go back in there, and it's gone. Look in the trash thing, it's gone. And people will take them. I'll put little glow cards in the seats. I'll go through the malls. I'll put them inside a pair of jeans you know, in the pockets or inside the ladies' handbags, and they'll, you know. One of these days, we laugh, but one of these days, when we get to heaven, somebody's going to stand up there, and we're going to say, tell us, how did you find Jesus? Oh, this is crazy. I found Jesus at 40,000 feet in the bathroom of the Delta flight. <laughs> and you know what? It's going to be true. This is our problem. We have so many excuses. And that's the title of this message, Enough Excuses. If you truly believe Jesus Christ is coming, then you know what? Go out and do the work. What are you afraid of? I'll tell you what you're afraid of. You're afraid of the lack of confidence that you have in yourself which is the what? You lack the faith and trust in God. From the sixth volume of the testimony, page 422, their lack of interest in the salvation of souls showed they had lost their first love. For none can love God with the whole heart, mind, and soul without loving those for whom Christ has died. First love. What's the first love? Reach out and grab a hold of God. Don't let go. What's your second love? With your other hand, reach perishing souls. You will never have the ability to reach perishing souls unless you're connected to the one and only true source of power, Jesus Christ. You won't. Notice, this is exactly how Jesus summed up the commandments, too. When they came to him, he says, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And that's the greatest commandment. But the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Grab a hold of God. Reach perishing souls. Why is that so important? That is important because... 
Jesus is waiting to give us a crown. He wants to give us a crown. And that crown is going to be laden with jewels, stars in our crown. For every soul won to Jesus Christ, there will be one represented in the crown. One star. But did you know she says very clearly, there will be no starless crowns in heaven? There will be no starless crowns. We might say we love the Lord. We might go to church on Sabbath. We might pay tithe, return tithe. We might do all these things. But if we don't speak to other people about Jesus Christ, it makes us wonder, do you really love Jesus Christ? It's not because you have to. It's because you want to. Do you catch that? There's a big difference. It's not a job. It's a love relationship. If you love the Lord, then you know what? It should just flow out of you so naturally. Now, Don, I'm going to pick on you for a moment. Do you love Gloria? It's awfully quiet. Yes. How much do you love her? Could you, could you stand up for a moment? No, you. I, I'm leaving Glory alone. I'm picking on you. Would you tell everybody here how much you love her? Did, thank you. Did, did, you, did you see any nerve, nervousness in there? It just came out. I love her. I remember I did this once at Bogenhofen in Austria. I asked a man, I looked at him, and he was sitting right about where you were, and I said, do you love your wife? I said, so he understood me because there, there was no need for translation because you can always tell. If you say something and, and the people respond by laughing or saying amen, you can tell when they're doing it, when I'm saying it in English or when the translation comes up. And I asked him, do you love your wife? I said, would you stand up and tell everybody how much you love your wife? He looked at me and says, do I have to? <laughs> His wife looked at him. You see, that love should just naturally flow out. Do you love God? It should just flow out. My friends, it's time right now that we stop with the excuses. We've got to stop. If we don't tell others, I know that there are still more sermons to go, but this is my last sermon to the adult tent. And so I wanted to launch you off and, and give you this message. We've got to go forward with this thing. And isn't that what Ted Wilson's sermon was all about? Right. Forward, not backwards. We must be progressing constantly forward in our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we're not, then we must, we, we must ask ourselves, do we really love Jesus? Because he says, Peter, do you love me? Three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. I've called you. I've given you the light. But you know what? I'll tell you, I don't want to take this upon my shoulders and to be able to say, hear people say to me, but you knew the truth and you never told me. Tell, speak, don't be afraid. God says, I will be, be with you always to the very end of the age. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you because we, we have neglected to do what you have asked us to do. We have failed. We've fallen short. And we ask that you will help us 
you will ignite in us a passion for the gospel. That it will just, it will just radiate out of us just like a bright light would shine in darkness. Lord, give us a passion to be able to tell other people about you without any fear. Please, Lord, guide and direct your people. May we let the light of God shine out from us to a world that is starving, to ships who are groping with the torrential seas. May we be that beacon of of safety represented by the lighthouse, guiding ships safely to the harbor. Give us a passion for souls. In Jesus' name, amen.